Are you growing and maturing in Christ? Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Tolbert. Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, your online community of Christian education teachers and students of the Word. Thank you so much for joining us as we continue to explore the Word of God using the Precepts for Living commentary based on the International Uniform Lesson Series and edited by our founder, Dr. Melvin Banks Sr. Remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new lessons. And teachers and students of the Bible, you're invited to subscribe to PreceptsForLiving.com for complete lesson plans, videos, the Word Made Simple, and additional resource, resources. And let me say this, there's a team of scholars who are diligently working to put together resources and materials to help you, whether you are studying for your personal growth or whether you are studying because you're a teacher. So do subscribe. And when you do, you'll have access to precepts on your tablet, phone, or laptop. So go to preceptsforliving.com and get those resources today. Each week, we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format the text for you students of the word and teaching tips for those of you who teach. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, we love your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us this word to help us grow and mature in our relationship with you. We bless you now in your name we pray, amen. Let's explore the text, beginning with our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will remember or value the love of God described by the writer of 1 John, reflect on the various expressions of God's love in our lives, and respond to the challenge to love others with Christ-like love. We'll study our lesson by discussing what's important to know, cognitive, feel, effective, and do, psychomotor. The first set of verses is 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. There are two key points from the verses in this lesson. Jesus was fully God. And Jesus was fully man. I really want to say Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man because he still, he still is. <laughs> well, we're going to examine the background and context of these verses so we can better understand our lesson. There are three letters <clears throat> named 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and they're written near the end of the first century. It's decades after Christ has resurrected. The author is the Apostle John, who is writing to churches to which he was connected. These three letters have complementary writing styles and similar themes to the Gospel of John. There's a strong emphasis on the love of God, as well as the identity of Christ, and our identity as children of God. Third John is the shortest book in the Bible. First John, the longest of these three letters, first, second, and third John. First John clarifies the major teachings of the Christian faith with reflections on how to live as believers. The Apostle John encourages believers to stay devoted to Christ. The first set of verses in our scripture today affirm the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. He is fully God and fully man. 
Jesus was God in the flesh, a truth that countered many of the false teachings in the early church. Some are arguing that Christ was only a spirit and he had not really died as a human. John confronts that teaching with the truth in these verses and says that if someone claims that Jesus did not have a real body, in other words, that he was not fully human, that person is a false prophet or a false teacher. The Holy Spirit testifies that Jesus Christ had a real body. He was fully human. And to believe or teach that Jesus was only a spirit is the spirit of the Antichrist or a spirit that works against the truth of Christ. Let's read our next set of verses from 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. And God has given us this spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So, we will not be afraid on the day of judgment but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Oh. There are three key points from these beautiful verses we just read. True believers have the Holy Spirit. True believers testify that Jesus is the Son of God and True believers have the love of God. John continues to make the case to distinguish true followers of Jesus from false teachers and false believers who had infiltrated some of the churches. True believers have the Holy Spirit within them. True believers testified that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and true believers have the love of God. These are the markers of those who are truly disciples of Jesus Christ. When we show the love of God, we know that God's love is in us. And although we may not love perfectly, we grow in love daily as believers. The key doctrine that distinguishes true followers of Christ here is confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the key behavior is the love of God, which is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, who transforms us into the character of Christ. When we rest in the reality that God loves us, we don't have to fear Judgment Day. We're confident that we're in right relationship with God because God loves us and we love God as evidenced by our lives. And so we're confident that we're saved in the day of judgment because we trust in this good news that God loves us and gave Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Oh, this shouting time, isn't it? <laughs> well, this brings us to our final set of verses, and that's from 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. And again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. There are two key points from these final verses in the lesson. Keep the faith, and God is faithful. John often repeats himself in these epistles, which is an example of excellent pedagogy. Educators say that repetition 
is the mother of learning. And some biblical scholars contend that John's objective is to encourage reflection and meditation by writing in this way. So here in chapter five, John repeats again, Jesus Christ is a son of God. And he adds this new revelation. Because we believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God, we're able to overcome worldliness. We don't have to be afraid of or overpowered by the temptations of sin. Let me repeat that last statement. We do not have to be overpowered by the temptations of sin. We don't have to live a lifestyle of sin. And we don't have to fear the challenges of suffering or the threat of persecution or anything else because we trust in Jesus Christ. John encourages believers that regardless of what we face, we are overcomers because we are in right relationship with God and we rest in his all powerful love. That's what's important to know. How should we feel in response to today's lesson? We should feel encouraged by God's love in our lives. The love of God causes us to feel joy, peace, confidence, and strength. We don't have to fear anything because we rest in God's love and we continue to reflect on how many times God has protected us, provided for us, led us, delivered us, healed us, and been present with us, surrounding us with his love. Think about it. Write it down. Make a list and encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what's important to feel. What should we do in response to today's lesson? We should respond to the challenge to love others the way Christ loves us. It doesn't get any more simple than that. We have experienced the love of Jesus Christ as believers. God's love is so great that he gave his life for us. God's love protects us, provides for us, gives us wisdom, and gives us what we don't deserve because of his grace and favor. God's love doesn't change. He continues to take care of us and provides for our needs. His love is consistent. We share that love with others, beginning in our homes and in our churches and then flowing throughout our communities. And let me add this. We don't respond to how others are behaving. We love one another because this is how people will know that we are followers of Christ. God's love flows through us, regardless of how they're acting. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to demonstrate this great love that we've received. That's our scripture made simple. We remembered or valued the love of God described by the writer of 1 John. We reflected on the various expressions of God's love in our lives, and we respond to the challenge to love others with Christ-like love. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human, fills our hearts with the love of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be afraid of persecution. We're not under the power of sin, so we don't have to live a lifestyle of sin. And we can live perfect or mature lives because we are growing in Christ and becoming whom God calls us to be. We're sheltered by the love of God who provides for us, who protects us. And we have confidence that on that day of judgment, we will bow before the Lord our God without shame about the way we lived on earth because we live in the strength of God's love through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our text for today. Now let's talk about how to effectively teach this lesson. Don't forget to pray. 
do pray that your students will have receptive minds and hearts and spirits as they learn from God's word. They'll be doers of the word and that you'll teach with clarity, wisdom, creativity and discernment. And teacher, you will teach with clarity if you prepare your lesson in advance. So no teaching is effective if it's done at the last minute. You don't have time for the Holy Spirit to give you ideas and to give you creativity if you wait to the last minute. So start preparing your lesson a week in advance. And that's why we launch these videos so early, so that you have plenty of time to pray, prepare, and plan your lesson. Amen? Amen. Well, let's begin this lesson by hooking or opening the lesson by inviting participants to answer this question. How do we resist the temptations of worldliness? You want to stick around for mailbag for that answer. And also do download the in focus videos from preceptsforliving.com and answer the question at the end, which is this. How do we interact with others to show that we dwell in love with God? Excellent, excellent question. Ask children, what are you able to do this year that you were not able to do last year because you were a year younger? In other words, can you jump a little higher? Can you run a little faster? Or can you think better? And the idea of teacher, we want them to know that as they grow up, they are maturing and they're able to do more things. And so we want them to connect this to the lesson that we are all growing in Christ. And ask preteens and teens this question. Are you growing in spiritual maturity just as you are maturing in your age? You know, teens are always so excited. Oh, I'm 13, I'm 14. Okay, great, you're growing up. Are you maturing as a Christian as well? Good discussion for that age group. And now transition to book or present the scriptures by inviting volunteers to read the scriptures either in portions at a time or all at once, depending on your preference. And we do want you to ask what stood out or resonated to you from these verses. Do study the in-depth paragraphs. You're going to do that a week early, yes? <laughs> and there are three powerful titles. Confident Confessions is the first one, and that affirms that true believers confess the crucified, resurrected Christ. The second paragraph is Confident Judgment, which says that knowing that we are loved by God increases our need to see others saved. Yes? And then third, confident victory, which says that I have, when Christ says rather, that I have overcome the world, it's past tense. It's already done. So we have victory over sin. Oh, those are three powerful paragraphs to study. And then do also study more light on the text. This explanation and exegesis is a verse by verse discussion that is going to equip you and help you when you teach your Sunday school lesson, discipleship group or Bible study. Oh, you'll have more confidence. And then transition to look or explore the meaning. And this is when we relate to how does the lesson relate to me today? And this is our transition. And we're going to do that with questions because questions help learners learn. That's why there's so many questions in this lesson. So choose a few from in-depth, search the scriptures, or discuss the meaning. And here's a question we selected for today. Why is it important that we love one another? Now, that sounds like a simple question, but it is quite profound. So you'll have a good discussion with that question. And then transition into took or next step for application, which is what are we going to do with what we learned today? So invite a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson. And that paragraph is about the unconditional love of God. 
For application for activation, ask each person to read this paragraph silently and journal his or her reflections as they hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And how's this for a final exercise? Tell students, I want you to neighbor nudge. What's a neighbor nudge? You kind of nudge your neighbor. <laughs> and you discuss, how are we going to share the love of God with someone who really needs God's love? Now, don't let them answer this question too simplistically. We want them to think about who in their circle of family or friends or community, who is it who really needs to know God's love? And how are they going to let them know that God loves him or her? Well, then end the class in prayer that students will grow up and live as mature believers in God. God bless you as you teach. And now, let's talk mailbag. And welcome to Mailbag and happy birthday, Minister Alan Reynolds. We are so honored that you're celebrating your birthday with us by sharing with our audience on this wonderful, wonderful lesson. And I think you have some good news to share with them also because the question I'm going to ask will set many people free. Our lesson today says that we don't have to sin, that we have the freedom, we've been delivered. Could you please drive that point home? Absolutely. And it's uh, important, again, to recognize what the opposite of sin is, which is righteousness, right standing. So right standing or right relationship with God is about positioning more so than what it is that we do, right? When we are outside of Christ, we are away from God, right? The, our, our being, the way that we live life is away from what God's original intent is. And Christ, because he has died on the cross, his death was enough to pay for all sin, for all time, for all people who were willing to receive it, which is good news. And because of that, we are repositioned when we put our faith in Christ and turn away from our sin. Think about it. If I'm facing one direction, I've turned away from my sin, as you say all the time, that's what repentance is. And now I'm walking in the right direction with Christ. So I'm in the right relationship with Jesus and I walk rightly with others, as you always give those gestures, but I don't have to turn backwards, right? I don't have to turn to the right or the left. I don't have to do those things. Uh, the way to think about it, because I think this particularly gets to uh, individual and personal sin, right? Uh, because collective sin is a bigger, different deal that's also taken care of at the cross. But a lot of that, we can't control the fact that our systems are oppressive, right? Like that's exactly. sin on a global scale. Exactly. But we can absolutely, just as in any relationship, continue to grow in not doing things that the person that we love, the Lord, does not like, right? Mm -hmm. So if we think about it in those terms, in terms of that right relationship, I don't have to do things that displease God. And as a matter of fact, what John argues and what Jesus has purchased for us is that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. And our old tendency to sin, which was part of our humanity, part of our flesh under the first Adam, under original sin, under sin, you know, as humans, our tendency is now towards God. We have been turned away from unrighteousness and now we are again walking in the right direction. So it takes effort for me to sin now as a believer. There you it go. Takes it takes extra work. <laughs> exactly. It's the will is involved. Will I sin or will I obey the Lord? Yes? That's right. right. That's right. And we see the benefits as we walk with God of, of keeping in righteousness. 
Now, that's not to say that we will not fall short. Again, that's what sin is as well, to miss the mark, to fall short. We are not perfect. We, are, you know, Christ is the only one who is without sin. And we get this in 1 John 2. If anyone says that they have never sinned, then they're a liar, right? Like, that's not true. If anyone says that, you know, that they, that they don't have to wrestle with sin, that's not true. But because we're in Christ, we don't have to sin. And certainly, I'll just testify as a believer, and hopefully, and I know that there are many out many of you out there with the same sort of testimony, you don't do the things that you used to do before you walked with the Lord. We don't have to engage with the world the way that we used to before we walk with the Lord. And so that, that is also the reality, that we have choices. And the choice for freedom in Christ is what has been purchased for. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We're no longer slaves to sin, in bondage to sinful ways. We can choose to do what's right. And, and that's, that's what we're called to and invited into as believers. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. 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 The freedom in, in what you said about choices. So it's like if I'm dieting and I have a plate in front of me, I decide I'm going to eat this or I'm not going to eat that. I think about it in advance. And it's all the choices that we make during our day or week that leads us to sin or leads us to obedience, yes? Absolutely, and I do wanna clarify something because I think this is what trips up a lot of people. Yeah. Being tempted is not the same as sin everyone is tempted, right? We get that all throughout the New Testament. Jesus Christ was tempted, it says in the Gospels, in Hebrews, and yet he was without sin, right? So because we have faced a temptation, because we have a thought about sin or something comes, the enemy tries to come against you, your own stuff, your past tries to come against you, does not mean that you have sinned. It is sin when you choose to entertain and engage with that thing, when you say yes to temptation instead of saying no. And it, it really does become that simple for us when we're talking about our personal sin, that we can walk lives righteously because we make little choices every day to do what God wants us to do instead of doing what we want to do or what we used to do. Well said, well said. And as you were talking, I was thinking of the scripture that says, resist the devil. And the word to resist is like push back, you know, push like you're keeping a door closed, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we have an active role in keeping ourselves in right relationship with God. We are in right relationship with God, but we want to, we want to have a relationship that flows out of love. We want, don't want to live in guilt, we don't want to live in shame, and we don't want to live in defeat, because we don't have to. <laughs> it's so simple. Well, Minister Allen, would you read? Thank you so, so much for that explanation. Would you read our Keep in Mind verse for today? Absolutely. And our Keep in Mind verse comes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And it says this, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And again, that's 1 John 4, 16 in the New Living Translation. Child of God, oh, what great, great love the Savior has for us. It's immeasurable. It is freeing. It is the best thing we could ever hope for in life. And then Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you love him? I know you do. Have a great week.